Hello everybody. Welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will be discussing the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 3rd January 2020. Topics to be discussed are displayed on the screen and time stamping for the same are given in the description box below. So let's start. In order to give a push to health insurance penetration in India, the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority has come out with a guideline for a standard health insurance product that meets the basic needs of the consumers in India. Now in this context, this article appears on page number 15 and becomes important from the perspective of General Studies Paper 2 under the subsection Issues Related to Development and Management of Health. Now before we discuss this topic, it is important to note that though it is highly unlikely that a separate question on health insurance be asked in the examination, you may use this content while answering questions on health system in India. Now as it is well known, the health system in India is marred with high out of pocket expenditure which is about 70% of the total health expenditure on account of extremely low insurance penetration in India. Now besides, India is also undergoing what is called as an epidemiological transition where the population is facing a double burden of both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Now in addition, Niti Aayog in its recent report on health system for 21st century India identifies risk pooling as one of the pillars of the health system for new India. Now despite the importance of better risk pooling in Indian health systems, the health insurance penetration is extremely low primarily as a result of the nature of health products and the health insurance sector in general which is clogged with issues including lack of awareness of the diseases that are covered in health products, denial of claims in a number of cases and also reduced payouts than what is expected by the consumer. Now in this backdrop, the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India has come out with a guideline for a standard health insurance product that is more transparent, inclusive and uniform in order to enhance the insurance penetration in India. Thus, as a part of this news analysis, let us have a look at the need for such guidelines for a standard health insurance policy. In that, we'll see the challenges in the current health products and the main features of a standard health insurance policy in order to tackle the problem of low health insurance penetration in India. Now, as I've already mentioned, one of the main reasons for low health insurance penetration in India is the nature of health insurance sector in general and the health insurance products in particular. Now the health space in India is witnessing a changing technology as a result of which a number of novel treatments have started entering the health space. Now the current health insurance policies do not cover these novel treatments and advanced medical procedure which are included in what is called as the exclusion lists. Now a number of novel pro medical procedures like robotic surgery, hormone replacement therapy, balloon sinuplasty, oral chemotherapy, cyber knife, stem cell therapy, laser surgery in case of cataract etc are included in this exclusion list which puts a huge burden on the out of pocket expenditure of the patients due to high cost of these novel treatments. Now besides lack of awareness about these exclusion lists has resulted in a number of problems including claim denials and reduced payouts by the insurance companies. Now this problem of an elaborate exclusion list which do not cover the novel treatments and the advanced medical procedures and lack of awareness about the same has discouraged the insurance penetration in India. Now besides as I have mentioned India is undergoing an epidemiological transition with dual burden of both non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases. Now as a result of growing urbanization, India is witnessing new age diseases including lifestyle disorders that has changed the disease profile in the population with increasing number of non-communicable diseases which contribute to about 61.8% according to state of health report that was recently released by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now these new age diseases include 
including hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, etc., which are covered under the current insurance policies, have extremely high waiting period, and as a result, these insurance policies have proved to be ineffective in India. Now, besides, one of the major concerns in health insurance sector in India is the non-declaration or misrepresentation of material facts in the policy contract. Now, thus this lack of standard terminologies and lack of transparency in the terms and conditions has also contributed to low insurance penetration in India. Now, besides the current health insurance products in India are priced primarily on the basis of the medical treatments and do not involve a number of non-medical consumables which includes diagnostics, OPD charges and other pre-hospitalization and post-hospitalization charges. Now as a result, the health insurance products are not paying for non-medicinal expenses which has made their out-of-pocket expenditure extremely high. Now besides lack of transparency of these non-payables has also resulted in higher than expected out-of-pocket expenditure which has become the major hurdle for insurance penetration in India. Now, given these challenges, risk pooling in India, which is envisaged to be one of the pillars of health system of 21st century, has taken a serious setback. Now, as a result, the IRDA or the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority, which is the regulator for insurance sector, has come out with a guidelines for standard health insurance policy primarily in order to make health insurance policy more transparent, more uniform and more consumer friendly in order to increase the health insurance penetration in the country. Now, keeping in mind the challenges of the current health insurance products, the main features of a standard health insurance product include a basic cover in that the health insurance product will have a minimum basic sum of 1 lakh rupees and a maximum limit of 5 lakh rupees. Now in addition, the IRDA has also standardized the entry age and has set the age bracket from 18 to 65. Now as you must be aware, currently a number of people on account of their age have been denied health insurance products by health insurance companies and therefore or IRDA has standardized the entry age from 18 to 65 in order to increase the health insurance penetration in India. Now in addition, a standard health insurance product will be a product with basic mandatory covers that are based on the needs of the consumer and will not have any add-ons or additional covers. Now this essentially means that a standard health insurance product will be a need based product and purely an insurance product thereby reducing the premiums on these products. Now this is done essentially in order to standardize the pricing mechanism that will go a long way in increasing the insurance penetration. Now besides the IRDA is all set to streamline the exclusion list which do not cover a number of novel treatments and advanced medical procedures as I have mentioned which is hindering the growth of insurance sector in India. Now thus as a result, the standard health insurance policy under its basic cover will include a number of novel treatments including treatment for cataract, dental treatments, plastic surgery in case of disease or injury, the ICU charges etc. Now in addition, IRDA will also bring out a pre-decided exclusion list which makes it clear for the consumer as to what diseases are covered and what are left out thereby bringing in transparency in these exclusion lists. Now in addition, with the recent thrust on alternate medicine, a standard health insurance product is also said to include expenses that are incurred on the treatment under the Ayurveda, Unani, Siddha and homeopathy systems that is growingly being preferred by a number of consumers. Now besides a standard product also includes a pre-hospitalization and a post-hospitalization medical expenses in order to reduce the out-of-pocket expenditures. With the changing disease incidence tilting towards non-communicable diseases, the insurance products are also designed in order to promote wellness among public in general by providing an incentive to wellness in the form of free health checkups, fitness activities, etc. Now this standard health insurance product which is named as Arogya Sanjeevani policy is set to increase insurance penetration in India by bringing in transparency, uniformity and more consumer friendly.
Now, as I've mentioned, though a separate question on health insurance sector is highly unlikely, you may use the points that we have discussed here while writing answers on health systems in general. Now, with this, let's move to the next news. Now, the recently approved Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund has made its debut in the secondary market. Now, in this context, this news appears on page number 15 under the title Bharat Bond debuts on bourses and becomes important from the perspective of general studies paper 3 under the subsection issues related to mobilization of resources. Now recently the cabinet committee on economic affairs had approved for the establishment of Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund which is India's first corporate bond exchange traded fund in line with its policy of disinvestment in central public sector enterprises. Now this topic on Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund was covered as a part of DNS analysis of 5th December 2019 in the backdrop of the establishment of this fund. So let's revise the basics of this Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund. Now before we look into the features of this Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund, let us understand what is Exchange Traded Fund. Now the exchange traded fund is basically a fund that is created out of pooled assets something similar to a mutual fund. Now as you can see here the exchange traded fund is created by pooling together different assets that could be a share of a company, a bond, a foreign currency etc. Now once these assets are pooled together and accumulated to form an exchange traded fund this accumulated asset is then divided into unit value similar to a share which is then traded in the secondary market. Now it is important to note that the value of this exchange traded fund comes from the value of this underlying assets which as I said could be a share of a company which basically means equity. The underlying asset could be a bond or a foreign currency. Now this Bharat bond which is being launched by the government is basically a bond based exchange traded fund. In that the Bharat bond exchange traded fund is basically formed by pooling together the bonds of different public sector enterprises and this accumulated exchange traded fund is then divided into unit pieces which are basically traded on a secondary market just like shares. Now because these exchange traded funds comprises of shares of different companies, they are also known as index funds. Now having understood the basic principle behind exchange traded fund, let us see the difference between exchange traded fund and mutual fund. Now as I have already mentioned, both exchange traded fund and mutual funds are pooled assets in that the fund is created by accumulating assets of different companies. However, these two differ with respect to the tradability in that while buying and selling of mutual fund means that you are directly transacting with the fund, buying and selling of exchange traded fund on the other hand is just like buying and selling of shares. Further while mutual fund is basically managed by fund managers, the exchange traded funds are managed by the investor himself. Besides while mutual fund is bought and sold at a price of shares at the close of the day, exchange traded funds are basically traded throughout the day thereby giving liquidity and marketability to exchange traded funds. Now having understood the difference between exchange traded funds and mutual funds, let us look at some of the features of this Bharat bond exchange traded fund. Now as I have already stated. Bharat Bond Exchange Traded Fund is a bond based exchange traded fund in that it is a basket of bonds basically issued by the central public sector enterprises, the central public sector undertakings and some financial institutions or any other government organization bonds. Now in order to attract the retail investors, this Bharat Bond has a very small unit size of 1000 rupees. Now besides since these instruments are created out of government bonds, these are extremely safe. Now given the characteristic of tradability of exchange traded fund on the secondary market, these funds are extremely liquid. Besides, since the unit value is only rupees 1000, 
it provides for easy and low cost access to bond markets to retail investors who are currently not participating in the bond market now as to benefits to the central public sector enterprises it provides an additional source of funding in addition to the bank finances it widens the investor base of the central public sector enterprises besides due to the low unit value and consequent increase in demand for these bonds the cost of borrowing for central public sector enterprises will be extremely low now as a result of these advantages the overall bond markets are expected to deepen with enhanced retail participation and finally reduced borrowing costs for the central public sector enterprises now as i have mentioned this topic becomes important both from prelims and mains examination in prelims examination concept based on exchange traded funds and the characteristic features of bharat bond may be asked besides you may use this content as a part of your answer in questions relating to mobilization of resources under general studies paper 3 now with this let's move to the next news now this article appears on page number 10 and relates to the role of united states in the changing world order and becomes important from the perspective of general studies paper 2 under international relations Now in this article the author identifies the relative decline of United States as one of the defining features of geopolitics of the past decade. Now in order to illustrate this point the author in this article takes the example of a number of cases in West Asia where the US has failed to influence the geopolitics of the region particularly with respect to Afghanistan, Syria and Iran. Now in addition The author also talks about a post alliance world in that the role of US led NATO particularly in West Asia has been declining. Now this is on account of recent stress in relation of US with Turkey particularly with respect to S400 deal of Turkey with Russia. Now it should be noted that West Asia which was a geopolitical theater of the cold war era was dominated by united states in the post cold war period now however as the author in this article points out the us hegemony in west asia has been declining which is visible in its inability to shape the geopolitics of the region as can be seen in afghanistan syria and iran So as a part of this news analysis let us understand US strategy particularly in three regions including Afghanistan Syria and Turkey and Iran now coming to Afghanistan in the aftermath of 9/11 the US waged a war on terror in Afghanistan with two fold objectives of defeating the al qaeda and toppling the taliban regime while US has been fairly successful in its first objective of defeating the al qaeda that culminated in the killing of osama bin laden the toppling of taliban regime in afghanistan has not yielded this much needed stability in the country now as a result the us has reoriented its strategy in afghanistan and has recently held peace talks directly with the taliban under the condition that the taliban would not use the afghan soil for transnational terrorist activities now besides the us is desperate of an exit from afghanistan as the trump administration sees the continuation of us forces in afghanistan as a dent on its national resources and therefore has been desperate to exit the country now this reorientation of united states in afghanistan is just a reflection of the failure of united states to bring in stability in countries where it has sought to bring in a regime change now for example the us campaigns for regime change in iraq and libya have also failed to bring in the much needed stability in these countries notwithstanding the fact that it has been successful in defeating the current regimes on account of its military prowess now thus while us because of its military prowess has been successful in waging wars in the region as was done against al qaeda the us influence in bringing in stability in these countries have not been successful which has led to us reorienting its policy and exiting the region in haste now thus 
while US's reorientation of its strategy might serve well for its domestic interests, it has at the same time brought down the US stature in the global world order as a result of its declining influence in the geopolitics of the region. Now coming to Syria and Turkey, you must be aware that recently US withdrew its support to the Kurdish militia in Syria which was instrumental along with United States for the defeat of Islamic State in Syria. Now this withdrawal of support from Kurdish forces was despite the fact that Turkey had invaded the Kurdish region in the north and northeastern part of Syria leaving the role of US as a mere spectator. Now besides, it should also be noted that in a significant twist to geopolitics in the region, Turkey has now allied with the Russian-backed Syrian government in order to create a buffer region between Syria and Turkey to arrest the spread of Kurdish forces into Turkey. Now this rejig in alliances, particularly in the Syrian region, has led to various sections of the intelligentsia concluding that West Asia has turned into a post-alliance world that is witnessing change in alliances, particularly those that were led by the United States. Now in addition, the US-led NATO military alliance in the West Asia has come under serious strain in the recent past on account of Turkey's deal with Russia for purchases of S-400 missile defense systems. Now, US has threatened sanctions under Katsa on Turkey for S-400 purchases and has also cancelled the F-35 fighter jet deal, signifying a strain in US's relation with Turkey, which was one of its closest NATO ally in the region in the post-Cold War period. Now coming to the issue of Iran, you must be aware that US in May 2018 withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action popularly called as Iran Nuclear Deal that was signed in 2015 between Iran and P5 plus 1. Now in the aftermath of the US withdrawal from the nuclear deal, US imposed a number of trade and economic sanctions against Iran in order to stifle the Iranian economy. Now, while this step was taken in order to influence the behavior of Iran in the region, it is meted out with maximum resistance on part of Iran which has resorted to a number of military strikes and has also restored its uranium enrichment program that was restricted under the Iranian nuclear deal. Now it should be noted that since May 2019, a number of oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz that lie between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman has come under multiple attacks. Now besides, in June 2019, Iran shot down an American drone that had allegedly violated the Iranian airspace. Now besides, Iran also seized a British tanker in July near Strait of Hormuz after an Iranian ship was captured by British forces in the Strait of Gibraltar. Now, in a recent incident, the Iran-backed Houthi rebellions of Yemen have attacked the Saudi oil facilities in Abqaiq and Quraysh, taking the tensions between Saudi and Iran to the brink of a conflict. Now, given the long association between Saudi and US, the attack on these Saudi oil facilities at Abqaiq and Quraysh is seen as a direct challenge to the hegemony of US in the region, which has so far responded only by imposing further sanctions. Now, though in this article, the author highlights that the US response to Iran's resistance has been confined to sanctions, it should be noted that US has gone beyond sanctions by declaring the Iranian army, which is the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, as a terrorist organization. Now, besides, US has also deployed an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf in response to rising military presence of Iran in the Persian Gulf. Now, as recently as yesterday, the US has declared that it has killed the general of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard which is expected to further escalate the tensions in the region. Now, in addition to this discussion, it is important to note that the location of these oil facilities become important from the perspective of prelims examination. And the names of two Iranian uranium enrichment facilities, namely Natanz and Fordo. Now, with this, let's move to the next news. 
Now this article appears on page number 10 and relates to Swachh Survection Survey that was released by Ministry of Urban Development recently. Now according to this latest Swachh Survection Survey 2020, Indoor for the third consecutive year has been named the cleanest city in India followed by Bhopal and Chandigarh. Now in this context, the author in this article raises some of the concerns with respect to this survey and emphasizes the need to recalibrate this survey with focus on sustaining the cleanliness rather than mere symbolism. Launched in 2016, the Swat Survection Survey is a ranking exercise taken up by the Government of India in order to assess the cleanliness levels of urban and rural areas and also to monitor the implementation of the Swatch Bharat Mission initiatives by the states in a timely manner. Now, the main aim of the survey is to encourage large-scale citizen participation in cleanliness activities and also to foster competition between the states in order to improve service delivery related to cleanliness initiatives. Now, while the Ministry of Urban Development is the nodal ministry for Swachh Survection Survey in urban areas, it is the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation that is the nodal agency for the survey in rural areas. Now, besides the Quality Council of India has been entrusted with the responsibility of carrying out the assessment for this survey. Now, coming to the concerns that are raised in this article, the author is of the opinion that while the survey is a good step in fostering competition between the states, there are a number of cities that lack necessary infrastructure, particularly with respect to solid waste management, which is one of the main components of the Swachh Bharat mission. Now, while the solid waste management infrastructure requires huge investments, most of the urban local bodies have failed to effectively manage their garbage and thus there is an urgent need to expedite the funding to these projects for management of wastes. Now, in addition, the author also highlights that the Swachh Survection Survey is extremely narrow in that it focuses only on cleanliness and sanitation, whereas a successful sanitation survey should include an integrated outlook with a holistic view on housing, sanitation, water supply, waste management, transport, etc. Now, besides, the author is also of the opinion that the Swachh Survection Survey should enhance its scope to measure the initiatives of the states in order to build a circular economy with focus on least waste by employing the principle of three R's that is reduce, reuse and recycle. Now, this would reduce the human footprint on the environment and thus should be given highest weightage in this survey. Now, in nutshell, while the author in this article concedes that the survey is a novel method to enhance cleanliness and sanitation, there is a need to recalibrate the survey in order to focus on sustainability than a mere focus on cleanliness. Now, with this, let's move to the next news. Now, in order to enhance the tactical and strategic defense capabilities of India, the Prime Minister has launched the Young Scientist Labs of DRDO, which will develop cutting-edge and futuristic technology of military weaponry for 21st century. Now, in this context, this news appears on page number 8 and becomes important from the perspective of General Studies Paper 3 under the head Security. Now, while the details of these labs are not yet public, there are five different laboratories that will be working on artificial intelligence, quantum technology, cognitive technology, asymmetric technology and smart materials in order to make India self-reliant in the defense technologies of the future. So, we will be covering this news as and when the details of these labs are put in the public domain. Now, besides, it is important to note that these young scientists laboratories will employ scientists only under the age of 35. With this, let's take up the practice questions. Now, this question is framed on the basis of this article that appears on page number 15 with respect to the Purchasing Managers Index. Now, accordingly, the Purchasing Managers Index in India has increased to 52.7 in December 2019, which hints at a possible revival of the manufacturing sector amidst the economic slowdown. Now, this Purchasing Managers Index is basically an indicator of investor sentiment in the manufacturing sector of any economy. 
Now while the IIP or the index of industrial production measures the growth in volume of production, the purchasing managers index shows only the business momentum in the industrial sector in any economy. Now this purchasing managers index is calculated on the basis of information received from companies on various factors which basically reflect the demand conditions in an economy. Now besides it is important to note that, that the purchasing managers index for India is calculated by the Japanese firm Nikki. Now in this context this question reads with reference to purchasing managers index consider the following statements. It tracks the manufacturing activity in both public and private sectors which is wrong in that the purchasing manager index tracks the manufacturing activity only in private sector. Now the second option reads a reading of above 50 denotes expansion while reading of below 50 denotes contraction which is true and hence the right option is B2 only. Now coming to the second question this question is framed on the basis of this news that appears on page number 9 with respect to data related to tiger deaths. Now according to data published by Ministry of Environment and Forest, the number of tiger deaths in 2019 was 95 and this is the first time that the number of tiger deaths has gone below 100 in the last 3 years. Now a related question reads, the term T into 2 is sometimes seen in news in the context of which of the following? Now in the backdrop of the first global tiger day that was celebrated in St. Petersburg in 2010, the 13 tiger range countries for the first time committed to double the number of tigers by 2022, which is in short called as T into 2. Now thus option B is the correct answer, which is maintenance of tiger reserves. With this, we come to the end of today's discussion. Now let's take up the question for the day.